Well, welcome to Christ and Culture. This is Pastor Jeff Short, your Bible teacher and cultural commentator. And today we're going to be talking about a topic that I am connected to personally because I attended Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, north of Chicago. And I enjoyed my years at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, got a Master of Divinity, and then uh, later on, about 10 years later, I went out to Fuller Seminary and got a Doctor of Ministry there. So I've been through the evangelical institutions, you might say, from top to bottom. Uh, Went to Wheaton College in Illinois for my undergraduate, and then went to Trinity Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois, and then went out to Fuller in Pasadena, California. So I've been to different uh, institutions within evangelicalism, and what I'm seeing, unfortunately, is a weakness of leadership at the highest levels at a lot of these institutions right now, sadly. In a time where we need some strong leaders, we need people who will make bold statements and draw a line in the sand, we're seeing a lot of weakness at the top levels. And here is just another example. I am on the Trinity. uh, Now it's called Trinity International University. When I went to Trinity Divinity School, it was just called uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And it was a separate institution from the college. There was a Trinity College where I attended for one semester before attending uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. So I've been both to the college and the divinity school there at Trinity on the campus. And the uh, recently, the relatively recently, the divinity school and the college merged, and now they're all called Trinity International University. But unfortunately, um, the president, the new president, Nicholas Perrin, has announced that there will no longer be in-person education for the college side, which is a huge, huge setback for any college to say we're no longer meeting in person, and we're not even during a pandemic time. This is just a post-pandemic, and the college is now foregoing in-person education. Well, what kind of a college student would want to spend all this money and not get the full college experience. Who wants to spend all that money and just get an online degree? So this is really a problem, but that's not the problem I want to talk about today. The problem I talk about today is an apology from the new president over something that really doesn't need to be apologized. And, um, So we're going to talk about this, and and this is a trend in evangelicalism today where you just apologize for anything that offends anyone at any time. And this is a bad trend. I saw a couple years ago where the popular speaker and Christian apologist Josh McDowell gave a talk and expressed some views and expressed some of his observations and make some statements, and it somehow offended the African-American community or people of color community or the minority community. I don't know whatever designation is being used. But so I went back, looked at what he said. I thought, well, my goodness, this doesn't sound very serious. It doesn't seem like it should be that offensive. I mean, people say things all the time. Uh, that are offended to me as a Christian, and they don't come back and apologize and grovel and and throw themselves at the feet of uh, political correctness. But Josh McDowell, a week or so later, comes out with an apology and groveling apology. shouldn't have used this language. He was sorry. And I thought, why are we apologizing for things that are not apologize-worthy? I mean, I can see... um, if there was a major gaffe, you know, getting the wrong person, attributing the wrong quote to somebody. I think years ago, decades and decades ago, there was a popular Christian author 
who quoted someone as saying something, but totally misquoted the person, did not get it right at all, and had to, and actually got sued. And I could see, yeah, you want to correct that because it's an actual blunder. It's a mistake. It's something you need to apologize for. And he did. Uh, but something minor or trivial or something that is just politically incorrect that you say that might have offended someone at some point or even offended a group, uh, that doesn't mean you have to grovel and apologize for it. This is a sign of weakness, not of strength in Christ. Well, here again, we have a situation where an evangelical Christian leader is apologizing for something that I can't see why, um, especially with the culture war that's going on and the secular attack on Christianity and the Christian values. Why, why would we want to apologize for standing strong for Christ? Well, the first time I realized that there was some kind of a groveling apology happening in connection with my alma mater here was when I got an email um, recently from the president. I'm on the mailing list, and it says, and I'll read it here. It says, uh, Dear friends, recently Trinity donors received a letter bearing my signature, a letter whose introduction included passing comments connecting contemporary society's embrace of transgenderism with the gospel's waning influence within Western culture. Okay, great. That's exactly true. Whatever, whatever otherwise valid points the communication may have attempting to make, many found these impossible to hear given a few glaring missteps. Many found these impossible to hear? So what was this grave misstep that he's talking about? Um, what is he talking about that, that is such a, a terrible uh, uh, saying that he has to come back and apologize in allowing this letter to be released, I messed up and I owe everyone an explanation. I will focus on two points. Okay, what is this major crisis in his letter that he sent out? And I will get to what he actually said in a minute because it's been reported by some other news outlets. In the first place, with so many issues facing the church, the focus on gender dysphoria and in, in important development, certainly, but not the most pressing one in my mind, it is a pressing one. Uh, you know, what are the ones that are more important right now in our culture, um, other than, say, getting people saved for the gospel? But this is a Christian issue that Christians should bear witness to the truth of Christ. Concerning the truth of genders, which is the Bible describes perfectly for us as male and female, he says, in the first place, with so many issues facing the church— like what? The focus on gender dysphoria appears arbitrary. No, it's not. It's not because that's the tip of the spear of what the secular uh, satanic forces are attacking the church and Christianity at right now. This gender transgender push right now is the tip of the spear in the, in the war, the spiritual warfare we're going through. So why minimize it now? Uh, giving the possible appearance of targeting that issue. No, it doesn't mean you're targeting transgender people. It just means you're pointing out something that's true. Don't apologize for standing for the truth. In reading this letter, one may be forgiven for wondering whether Trinity is now suddenly aligning itself with the all-too-familiar scripts seeking to bash individuals who struggle in this area. No, nobody would think that unless you were a gay activist or a transgender activist or some person on the far left who's looking for any excuse to uh, appear to be offended. But no, that what he says, and we'll talk about this later, is harmful, harmless, excuse me, harmless. It does, it's t mild, it's tame. I assure you that this is not the case. Jesus Christ came to save the world, not to target or condemn it. No, your remarks were not targeting anyone. In the second place, in con con connecting on the challenges posed by the cultural acceptance of trend ideology, 
the letter could have done a better job in bringing to bear the kind of pastoral sensitivity on this topic deserves? Well, no, not necessarily, because part of a pastoral responsibility is to uh, speak the truth in love. It's to rebuke, exhort, and admonish people in their sins to repent, to call people to repent, and so on and so forth. So we don't always have to take a sort of sympathetic response, and that does not mean that we're not being pastoral if we speak prophetically, because pastors have to learn how to speak prophetically. Many people reading this letter, I am certain, either know of or deeply care for someone who has either struggled with gender identity or is struggling with it now. Okay, so what? We still still speak prophetically whether we know people who are in a sin or not. Again, this groveling apology, this weakness in evangelical leadership, citing this example, this president, Nicholas Perrin, is now going back on a good statement that he made about a cultural problem, and now he's apologizing for it, basically nullifying everything he said prophetically. One could hardly think of an issue that today has more charged and is requiring more sensitivity than this one. Uh, yeah, sensitivity, but also prophetic truth speaking. We have so many pastors who are either cowardly or afraid or anxious to say anything that might offend anybody. That's the default position in evangelicalism today. So what you said initially was actually what is needed for at this moment in time. And yet the tone of the letter failed to instantiate the kind of sensitivity in which we aspire here at Trinity. That is wimpiness coming out all over the place. I take full responsibility for any pain or frustration that this caused members of the Trinity. Pain or frustration? In your letter? This is totally a capitulation to, yeah, the LGBTQ activists have a lot of pain and frustration when they hear something that's true that convicts them of their sins. So, and then he says, you deserve better and I promise that you will do, you, I will do better going forward. Yeah, okay. No, we deserve a president who will actually stand up to the culture and not being bullied into submission like you have been. This is really sad to see the head of a institution, the head of the Divinity School and the college groveling between the outrage mob trying to gain acceptance by the LGBTQ activists, and they're not going to like him anyway. So he needs to just go ahead and say, what I said stands because it's speaking prophetically from the Bible. And if you don't like it, you can lump it. Okay, let's see what he actually said. Because this was uh, reported by the Inside Higher Education. And so let's, uh, let's just see what how they summarize it. This is going to be a biased summary, of course. This is a leftist um, institution. There's that write-up, and then there's also a write-up from the Baptist Global News, which is another kind of leftist-leaning uh, institution. It's not a Southern Baptist or a conservative Baptist. It's more of a... a I would call it the mushy middle, or I would say it's actually leftist leaning. So, so this is going to be a little biased too, but let's just see how they write it up. Evangelical University president seeks to raise money by casting blame on transgender people. No, he wasn't. Casting blame on transgender people. No, he was, he was saying that we are being overrun by sexual deviant perverts. My words. I'm summarizing the president's talk, and that is exactly true. And there is the president, Nicholas Perrin. He's actually quite a scholar, 
in and of his own credit. And he taught at Wheaton College, my old alma mater, and he also is now connected with Trinity uh, Divinity School, where I went to seminary. So this is something personal with me because I don't like to see our leaders in Christianity kowtow to the outrage mob. And that's what the left always gets us to do, to apologize for things that we don't need to be apologizing for. Okay, let's read this summary. The president of Trinity International University this week sent out a fundraising letter complaining about cultural acceptance of transgender people. Valid point. And linking this acceptance to recent mass shooting that left six people dead in Nashville. Okay, that's fine. Yes, and we are not getting that so-called manifesto from this trans shooter because it's probably going to reveal a lot of hate against Christians. And this is this shooting occurred during a time period where there were uh, LGBTQ activists calling for a trance day of vengeance. Now, whether those two are linked, we don't know. We, the police are not releasing the uh, manifesto of this trans uh, activist shooter. So, yeah, the, there's probably a linkage between the shooting and anti-Christian animus on the part of the trans community. Some alum, alumni of the Evangelical School in Deerfield, Illinois, reacted with horror and dismay. You know, some? Uh, how many? Probably maybe a handful that you could count on one hand. It says much about the state of our culture when people barely flinch at a man proudly and confidently claiming to be a woman or whatever identity happens to be the trend of the month simply because he declares it to be so, the fundraising letter begins. Okay, that's true. That is true. There's nothing wrong with that statement. That statement needs to be said and said many times in our culture to rem remind people of what we're dealing with. As Western culture becomes increasingly antagonistic to the gospel, it also necessarily becomes increasingly detached from reality. Amen? Exactly. Prophetic truth. Speak it. It is no coincidence that a generation which denies the existence of the Creator and His laws also denies all other fundamental truths. That's right. Exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. I've said similar things in these videos um, in my programs. The tragic implications of our culture's dominant worldview became even more evident after the devastating shooting in Tennessee. Exactly. There is nothing wrong with what he said. There is nothing in this that needs apology. So why is he on his knees groveling before the outrage mob, the far left, and the trans activists? I have no idea why this man is capitulating so bad. President Nicholas Perrin then tells the potential donors, the men and women who helped form Trinity more than 125 years ago would have hardly believed the extent to which our culture has deteriorated. That is a, another true statement. That is totally true. The, the people who helped founded uh, Trinity uh, Seminary would have been sh totally shocked that we have gone off the deep end so far. Never fear, he continues, because the source of truth they looked for for answers, God's unchanging word, remains the lens through which our students are taught today. Whether the focus of study is theology or law, bioethics, and business, our students learn to apply God's transcendent truth to the issues they face. Exactly. So, in other words, what is happening at this evangelical college and seminary is the answer to what our culture is going through. That's the truth. David Kramer, whoever that is, a Trinity graduate who is a professor at Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary and managing editor of Institute of Mennonite Studies, was among those expressing shock at this fundraising appeal. So this is a liberal or someone who deconverted or is a progressive now, has gone radical left, who attended either, what, the seminary or the college at Trinity? I don't know. So let's hear what this um, leftist says. I'm aghast and ashamed. 
by the latest fundraising letter from President Parent. He's aghast. He's ashamed. This is the outrage mob. This is what the left does. They act like they're really offended and hurt. He didn't say it, but he could have also said, I am deeply hurt and grieved. You know, all that kind of language, emotional language. Regardless of one's theological anthropology, this is not the way I was taught to interpret and engage culture when I was a student. This letter is flippant, calloused, and dangerous. It reads like a fundraising letter from a right-wing political group, action group, instead of a theological place of education. Oh, don't be such a crybaby, this David Kramer. He's such a drama queen. Um, I don't know who this person is, but they are not an evangelical Christian. Uh, in, in this Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary, I bet you they're super liberal. And because a lot of the Mennonites now um, are very liberal and they are very leftist, and you cannot distinguish them from a lot of the so-called progressives. The unusual fundraising appeal has motivated Kramer, who earned a PhD and previously taught at Baylor University, to donate to organizations that provide support and care for our trans neighbors who are created in the image of God and who are beloved children of God, he said. That's not the way a biblical Christian talks about the sin of transgenderism. A biblical Christian says, talks in terms of rebellion against God, rebellion against the will of God, um, disobeying the Bible's clear teaching. Are they made in the image of God? Yes, and that what, that's what makes it even worse because they know that this is not God's will to try to, quote, change your gender. This goes against everything the Bible teaches and this person is using the leftist language of our trans neighbors and beloved of God and all this stuff, mishy-mushy words. And this is what Perrin, the president of Trinity, is apologizing to. President Perrin continues in the letter to say his school's faculty ethnic, ethically, compassionately, and biblically address the issues facing our world. That's true. That's what I found in my education there. The financial appeal to help Trinity's faculty and students stands for truth, corresponds with the recent news that the school will move, okay, its undergraduate program to online only and will close the residential campus at the end of the current semester, okay. Trinity University comprises Trinity College, Trinity Graduate School, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Trinity Law, and a Camp Timberley. The officials, the school is filled with Evangelical Free Church of America and enrolls about 2,700 students. Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, this is my old alma mater, a once highly influential denominational school has declined from an FTT enrollment of 1,510 to 491 in the past 30 years. So it is quite a decline in the total enrollment, and that's sad. And I think one of the reasons for the decline is this weakness in the leadership at the top who will not take a stand and draw a line and say, this is sin and this is righteousness and we are going to be prophetic to the culture. But instead, they're trying to pander to the culture. This is what Perrin is doing. He found that something he said was offensive to somebody who either had gone to the school or maybe some of the students who are enrolled or some faculty member didn't like it or so-and-so. And instead of saying, well, I'm sorry that you were offended, but was anything I say not true? And really stand behind what he says. You know, this is an educated man. Um, he's written doctoral theses and he's he's been around academic papers in the world. He knows that what he puts in print, uh, he needs to be able to stand behind it or not. And so to back down like this is just showing a weakness where we need to show strength to the world and to the students of this college. 
I'm sure this is a disappointment to a lot of the students who are saying, no, stick with what you said. It's exactly true. That's why we're here at this Christian college. We're paying premium money. We're paying a premium cost to be at a distinctively Christian biblical school. And we don't want our president to wimp out and make it watered down so that if we're going to have a watered down Trinity experience, let's go to some state school. Um, for half the cost. No, you pay a premium to get the biblical prophetic edge that his original statement said. Perrin's predecessor as president was David Dockery, a Southern Baptist who currently serves as interim president at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. Dockery led the school from 2014 to 2019 when Perrin succeeded. Okay, so Perrin earned a bachelor's degree of English literature at John Hopkins University, a master of divinity from Covenant Theological Seminary, and a PhD biblical studies from Marquette University. He's previously taught New Testament early Christianity classes at Wheaton College. So he he is an academic. He He's an, a really smart guy. Has a PhD from Marquette University. That's in Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I believe. So... The problem is that he's willing to apologize. He's willing to apologize to the world for saying something perfectly true. And in fact, his original statement, that motivates me to go to an institution like Trinity. That's the kind of thing that I go, good, we're getting some prophetic truth coming from these institutions and they're willing to risk offending things, which is good. His problem is that he apologized to the outrage mob. And again, one of the rules that Christians have to abide by is that unless you say something wrong, and unless you say something that actually violates biblical love or justice don't go back and apologize just for public relations purposes or to pander to the woke mob don't don't back down don't fear that someone might be offended at you you are going to offend people if you're speaking the truth of god you are going to offend people so don't back down you're going to get hit if you're going to die on the battlefield, die for the truth. If you're going to go down, uh, go down with the words of biblical truth on your lips. Not going down with a whimper because you wimped out and backed down and surrendered ground or surrendered the field to the enemy. No, we need strong people in leadership positions who will say the transgender movement is evil it's wrong i'm sorry i'm not attacking individual trans members who are confused i'm attacking the movement and calling individuals to repent of this sin we need people who are brave and strong and not backing down who are not looking at polling data and not concerned about being popular with the culture, but are concerned about pleasing God first and foremost. That's what we need today more than ever. Well, I hope this has been an encouraging and helpful commentary, but we'll see you back next week. God bless.